Tonight's tour is on Victorian houses in New Bedford. We have an excellent collection of Victorians here. Um, we, if you went on the tour last year, um, we're doing all new buildings, all new houses. One, one house we're going to go by that I pretty much talk about almost every tour. But basically it's all new things, so I think we'll have a good time. House Across the Street is, is one of five that were built within, a, within a, at most a 10 year period from 1850 to 1860. It was on land that was owned by James Arnold, which always puzzles me really. Why would he take out, why would he have to sell these lots? Anyway, that's another story. But apparently he did, he did so. Cause I looked at it to see, did he really own this land? Was it part of his property and that he did sell it? Why would he sell it and so forth? But anyway, it was definitely on his land and he did sell the lots. There's about, there's five houses. They're all about the same. Um, really, except the detailing. And the one right here, the blue one, I chose to, to describe because it's a very nice house, it's in beautiful condition, and it sort of is, is typical of Victorian architecture. Now, this house here could be described in lots of ways, but it's probably, it, I'm going to describe it as a transitional house from the Greek Revival, which was a, a period of architecture in New Bedford from the 1830s and 40s and the Italianate style which was a uh, style popular in the 1850s. The houses that we're going to talk about on Cottage Street are all Italianates for the most part but the Italianate style was was uh, was uh, highlighted by these big brackets underneath the eaves like in this house the half round windows the cupolas and so far in these pediments, the, 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 that triangular thing over the main part of the house here on the roof line, that's a pediment. Um, and this, that's a typical of, the, of that particular style. But it also has lots of uh, uh, Greek revival uh, architecture. So my point here in talking about this is most houses were, was, were an amalgam of things. Um, very few of the Victorians were pure styles. They were usually a, 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 a mixture of styles. And this is, a, this is a classic case of a mixture of styles. The, the form itself, this big box, it's a, almost a square box, um, was very, very Greek Revival. Um, the, the dental work, you can see underneath the eaves, beautifully done. It's also in the cupola, if you can see the cupola at all, and also in the pediment, all that dental work. That, was, that would be a, a feature from, from, an early, from the Greek Revival period, an earlier period, and, um, and so forth. Uh, this is a beautiful building. Um, like this house on, and the one to the right here, that's more with that, with that, uh, the, the uh, triangular uh, roof line here and the half round windows, the half round windows in the, in the entryway. The half round windows is very, very uh, surely Italianate. If you see the half round windows or half round doors, that's an Italianate feature. So, um, so when we go to the various houses tonight, I'll probably talk about a style, but I'll say that it's really kind of a mixture of styles. And, and it was just a taste of the architect interpreting what he liked to see built, basically. When we go inside this house, I'll talk about the outside of this house in a second. But when, you, when we go into this house, which is a style called the French Second Empire style, basically because of the mansard roof in particular, that's the that slanted third floor, that's called the mansard roof. It was developed by a Frenchman in the 1840s and 50s, and almost every house with that mansard roof is called this, a French Second Empire style house. But it has lots of features of the houses that of all the other houses like this one and so forth. And when you go inside, you'll see a lot of doors that are half round, a lot of arches that are half round when you walk in there. Because you know, I've seen pictures of the video that we have of this house already. And so that is very typical of, of another style, the Italianate style. So they mixed and matched all the time. That's my point in making these things up. This house really is one of the great Victorians in New Bedford. There's no doubt. It's big. It's highly ornamented. Look at the entry. Look at the uh, the entryway here with all this fancy work. The columns, the capitals on the columns, the uh, the brackets underneath the eave here. Um, there's dental work and more brackets across the top. And also we have this sort of uh, balcony loggia type of thing here on the second floor, very attractive feature of the house. 
So highly ornamented, these, these corner decorations here called coins, Q-U-O-I-N-S, coins. They're on a lot of houses during this time period of the higher, uh, of the higher uh, uh, design. You can see the nice uh, window ornamentation underneath with the, with the finials and so forth. Just a great building, no doubt about it. Has a nice cupola on the top as well. Can't see it from here. Um, it's just a, it's really a massive building. Um, this was built in the 1860s, 1868, by a man named Edward Haskell. Uh, he was uh, um, a, real, a retailer in town, actually. Um, I don't know the story exactly on Haskell, but I think he committed suicide at some point. Uh, you know, and I'm not sure that why that would be. But um, anyway, this is one of the one of the great mansions. It's had its ups and downs. If you live in New Bedford long enough, you know, this house has had some issues with, with care over the years. But right now, it looks pretty good on the outside, and it looks pretty good on the inside. The house across the street is an octagon. Um, it's kind of too bad that it's completely, that most of the house is covered by foliage. It's not a very big house, but it's a beautifully ornamented house. As you can see, the brackets underneath the, the roof line and the balustrade along in between the, the hips in, in, the, in the roof line as well. You know, it's a, it's a very attractive house. I've been in that house. It's not a very big interior, but they make the most of it. The people, I think it's the Smiler, Chuck Smiler still lives there. And you know, they make the most of the, of the space they have and it's very attractive. It's a residential. It's a residential property, yeah. The original property included the carriage house over here. That's originally with the, um, the octagon, but it was sold and it's a separate, it's a separate house now. Not, they're not connected any, anymore. Um, but anyway, octagon houses were popular for a very short period of time in the 1830s and 40s. A man by the name of Orson Fowler, he was kind of a quack, really. He was like a snake oil salesman. A very, very, he was a very popular snake oil salesman. And during his time, he, his, 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 uh, his thing was um, that you could, to, you could determine a person's intelligence by the shape of his head. Huh. So it had a lot of uh, negative connotations for certain shapes of head and so forth. He was, it was called phrenology. If you want to look P-H-R-E-N, phrenology, and you'll hear about War Orson Fowler. He published a lot of books. He, he, one of his books was the Octagon House. He's the one who, who was espousing the virtues of the Octagon House. There were certain virtues that probably are, are real with the Octagon House. The problem with the Octagon, if you've ever been in one, there's another one on Arnold Street about, when we go to Arnold Street, it's about maybe three blocks west. It's a bigger one than this, and I've been in that one as well. The problem is getting the living spaces to match uh, your you know, daily life doesn't work out that well. It doesn't work out that well. And this one being kind of small, it's even more of a problem. But nonetheless, it's a, it's a beautiful building ornament wise. Um, they kept, they've kept it in tip top shape and over the years. I think they've owned it probably for close to 20 years now. Um, it's been on the tour in the past a couple of times, but um, not, I don't think recently they've been on, but on the tour. Um, but anyway, if it, if it, if it ever is on the tour again, it has it's, it's, like I said, small on the inside, but beautiful woodwork detailing on the stairs because, you know, the stairs are on the outside of the building on that side. That's how you get it to the second floor. It's kind of clever, actually, how they, how they manage manages the spaces in that house. There's lots of beautiful homes on this section of, of Cottage Street. And the um, east side of Cottage Street is the, is, was the Arnold Estate still. This was the back end of the, of the, of the um, property. It had uh, all kinds of plantings on it. So most of these houses here are from after 1880 on this side. But on this side, we have houses from the 1850s. In particular, we have these three, this one, this one, there's a building in between. And then another one, the one with the brown columns and so forth, you can see down there, three Italianate style houses, very similar in style, but only difference is the detailing really, built in the 1850s. You can see the half round windows at the top of the peak here, the half round windows in the cupola and in the doorway. That's the, that's the typical style. You get the nice big, nice brackets underneath the eaves, different styles on these three houses. But basically it's the same house. I think the same guy designed this, these three houses. There was probably a fourth one over here at some point. 
what that big uh, building is now, because that's relatively relatively new for that part of the street. But anyway, I think the same guy uh, designed and built them all. He just changed the um, um, uh, details a bit. It's too. It's it, and in my view, it's kind of too bad that they're, they're together because they're beautiful houses on their own. If they were all by themselves on another street, they would get a lot more attention, I think, because they're very nice houses. Uh, I think I think that they're all single families still. I'm not positive about that, but I think they're all single families, which is a nice thing. They're all pretty large. Houses this size are probably at least 2,500, 3,000 square feet. So they're good size homes. These, these were mansion style homes when they were built in the 1850s and they're nice houses. Now the other thing I want to talk about while we're here is the sidewalk. The Bedford was very, very proud of its flagstone sidewalks as early as the 1830s. And the one, that piece of bluestone, it was all bluestone, called bluestone. It's a sedimentary sandstone that was quarried in the Catskill Mountains. If you're familiar with upstate uh, in Hudson and Kingston, um, New York, it's probably 50, 60 miles north of New York City on the Hudson on the, on the uh, west side. That was the, that was the place where the bluestone was shipped from. It was all quarried in the, in the mountains of the Catskills, not far from there. And it was a highly prized decorative stone for lots of architectural detailing, but mostly for walkways. And this is some of the remnants of the bluestone. And this particular piece right here, it's usually blue, but some of it's kind of greenish. Some of it's that come. Some of it's called gunmetal, which is kind of a gray, uh, sort of an interesting color. Um, there's a lot of gunmetal and other types of different stones in front of the Double Bank Building downtown. That's the other great collection of bluestone in one spot is right in front of the Double Double Bank Building downtown at the foot of Will, William Street. But this piece here is one of the biggest ones I've ever seen in the city. It's huge, um, and. Um, by the 1840s, New Bedford had like 30 miles of bluestone sidewalks throughout the city. When we go on Maple Street, no, we're not going to go down Maple Street, but Maple Street has quite a bit left. Um, Hawthorne Street actually has quite a bit left, off and on. The deal, I guess, is that if when they put utilities in, well, before I get to that, in the 1860s, the mayor of New Bedford, whose name was Andrew Pierce, he was also a big time textile merchant, but he was the mayor at the time in the late 1860s, and he decided that um, after that they would con they put concrete sidewalks because the concrete was 80% uh, cheaper than, than flagstone, than bluestone. So from the 18, late 1860s on, concrete was used in, on sidewalks. And then since then, Apparently, from what I can gather from the city, if you have a utility put in, like if this house here has a utility put in, or the, you know has a water line that breaks or something like that, and he has to, they have to dig up the sidewalk, you have to request that the bluestone be replaced, be put back. If you don't request the bluestone to be put back, they'll take it out and put concrete and replace it with concrete. So um, this and this little stretch here. It's probably one of the best stretches of residential bluestone in the city, because on the other streets, trees have, have popped up the uh, have popped up the uh, the roots of the trees have popped up the bluestone, tough to walk on, um, and so forth. But 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 this little stretch here and that piece right there is one of the nicest pieces in the city. You got to walk got to walk around and look at the front entryway because it's so beautiful. This is one of New Bedford's really great Victorians in my view. Uh, 1887. It's a house that we classified as a Queen Anne style house. Uh, that was a late Victorian um, uh, style of house. It was most of the Queen Anne's, you, you know, it's by the big wraparound porches, which this doesn't have, and the towers and so forth that this, this, this particular house does have. Um, various uh, uh, textures of uh, siding. We have clapboards on the first level. And then we have this nice green uh, shaped, shaped shingles on the second level, and then regular shingles on the third level. That's typical of the, uh, of the uh, Queen Anne style. Look at the great detailing in the doorway with the, with the bullseye glass, and the, uh, just the detailing on the other glass in the door itself. Um, just a spectacular building, really. 
excellent paint job, very, very authentic. Um, the idea of all this ornamentation that's on the house is meant to be highlighted. You know, you don't put this stuff on the house unless you want to highlight it. And they've done so beautifully here with, with historical colors. Um, one thing to remember that for most Victorians, there's very little or no white paint. No white paint on Victorians. Um, all the details would have, they'd had plenty of colors. It was a very colorful style at the time. And even in the inside, there was, you know, like we went into the, the, the house that we walked into. Uh, when that, in its heyday, that house probably didn't have any white walls. They would all have been ornamented with probably either very, very exuberant wallpaper or, or very bold colors because that was the style that all designers used during that time. But this is a great house, 1887, um, one of the great um, Victorians and one of the nicest Queen Anne styles uh, in the city. New Bedford has a great collection of Italianate homes. Um, and this is one of the, probably the top two or three um, in the city, I think. Now, it hasn't been this well cared for for a while. But it is now, it seems, because this is a great building. You know, you can even see here by looking at the house how high the ceilings are in this house, just by, because it's probably from the, uh, the foundation to that first level there. You know, that's pretty high. You know, that's probably going to be 14, maybe 12, 13, 14 feet. That's a high ceiling, very high ceiling. And even the second floor, as you can see, is very high as well. This is a beautiful building. It's very, very, look at the huge brackets, the huge overhang and the big brackets, that's very typical of the style. The half round windows everywhere. This is a great building and it's a monster too. It's a big house. I don't know how many square feet that house is, but it's gotta be close to 4,000 and uh, maybe even more. Um, it's a big building and it's a nice building. Um, it doesn't have the square style. It's more of a, you know, a, a rambling uh, uh, floor plan, but nonetheless, it's a beautiful building and they've done a nice job painting it. Um, as well as uh, um, restoring it because not too long ago it was not in very good, good shape and there was a, some huge trees right in front. You couldn't even see some of the detailing on this house. But this is a great building. I would say this one in the, and the Loom Snow House that we're going to see next, next week and probably there's one on Madison Street um, as well. That's probably the three of the nicest. And, and the old Austin Carney Funeral Home. If you're familiar with that house on County Street, that's a beauty as well. So. Uh, we have a lot of nice ones, but this really takes the cake. This house here with the shingles is actually an addition to another house, which we're going to see in about five minutes. It was detached in 1906 and uh, remodeled in the back, um, and so it's its own house now. But this was a this was an addition. So that house you can see there with the chimney, if you look through there, that's the, that's the chimney that was the, for the original house. The addition was designed by a man named William Ralph Emerson, who was a pretty famous architect, not when he designed this house, but um, later on, uh, he, if you came on, the, if you came on the, the, the Hawthorne Street tour, I talked about him and the big house had been demolished on the site of the uh, uh, Jewish convalescent home. But this is a house in the, in, that was designed in the Gothic Revival style. Very cute little building, has all kinds of detailing. You can see the, uh, you know, the big archway to the street, which is typical. These window hoods, the, with the way they flare out over the windows. See how the, the top of the window has that design and then little flares at the end. That's typical of the, of the uh, Gothic Revival. All this tracery inside the glass all those X's and so forth, another typical example. The only thing that isn't kind of typical for um, a Gothic revival is the shingles. I'm not sure um, if the shingles are original or not. I would, if I had to guess, I would say no, but, um, but it's possible that it was shingled originally. I don't know. But I would say it probably when it was originally built, it was probably a flush board or a clabbered siding on the house. But nonetheless, still a very cool house. 1857 was when this was added on. Um, before we get to the next house, which I'm only going to talk briefly because every time I've, that house has been on all my tours, so you've probably seen it and heard me talk about it already. But nonetheless, um, this house was built because the house that the original house wasn't big enough for the family apparently, because um, uh, William J. Roach had uh, six or eight children, I forget how many, and as big as that the main house was, he still needed an addition, and this is the one that they put on uh, in 1857. 
This is the main house, the William J. Roach Cottage, one of the most famous uh, Gothics uh, in the country, really. And you can see it's, you know, it's got all the bells and whistles of a, of a major Gothic revival house. These great uh, decoration in the, uh, in the uh, um, gable, they often refer to that as gingerbread. Uh, this is gingerbread that's been heated and and with whipped cream, you know what I mean? This is, this is as good as it gets on this house. Um, the, the arch window, it's just a great building. It's, very, it's a National Historic Landmark because of its, of its famous as for this particular style. Just a great building. And this was the original house. This was the house that was too small for the family and they built the other one um, in the 1857. This one was built in 1846. Now this house was also moved when they when they sold, they could have all this all this property was just a couple of uh, was just one house from from uh, uh, Orchard Street to Cottage. It was just this this house, this property. And during the textile era, there was such a crush for new housing for executives and and other managers that all the big estates around here were torn down, and and multiple houses were put on the sites. And thank God, the uh, Roach family decided they wouldn't, they would sell the property and, and for lots and so forth, but they wouldn't demolish the house. They would just move the house back, separate the uh, addition from the main house, and get two for the price of one, basically. Um, but they didn't talk, knock it down, because this house was, was new on this site. That was part of the Roach property. The house in front of it was part of the Roach property, and, and over here as well. So um, thank God they, they did save the property, because the that spectacular house, but houses like this were moved pretty regularly. Uh, houses a lot bigger than this were moved regularly in New Bedford. Uh, it was just something that was done a lot uh, during those during that time. This is one of the cutest little houses in New Bedford, really. It's a Gothic revival in a different style, sort of a what they would call a carpenter Gothic or a little bit uh, more of a country style house. It has this board and batten, batten siding. It has the, the, the pointed arches and stuff, but you can see it's a little bit, it's a beautiful building, you know, but it's a little simpler in style and almost on purpose, really. Um, but it's a, just a great building. I have been in this house. It's really adorable on the inside as well. They have a spectacular, um, to my way of thinking anyway, a small stick style fireplace in this house, which I think that, you know, I think that that fireplace, probably a little bit later than when the house was built, 18. And there's a lot of problems dating this house. You, you know, there's been a lot of speculation that's a lot earlier than it is. Um, if I was to date this house without knowing its history, I probably would have said it was um, 1840s. But it's sometimes people date it as late as 1866, something like that. Um, so it's, it's, it's hard to figure when this house was actually built. But anyway, it's around from 1845 to 1865 when this house was built. Why don't somebody just said, when this is the house, it's an 1887 Queen Anne, and someone just said, there's a lot going on here. And yes, there is a lot going on here. It's still a cool house, but there is a lot going on. Lots of styles going on in this house. Um, I mean, I mean, call it a Queen Anne because of the time frame, but um, there's a lot of motifs here from other styles, shingle style, uh, you name it. But it's still a, a nice house, and it's a big house. I think now it's like a six a six family, but um, it wasn't a it was a single family house when it was built, and I think it's like six thousand square feet. This thing is huge. It goes all the way around, and it's all it's all it's big everywhere. You know, every, every facade is is big. Um, we're gonna have a picture of this house on the video that uh, came that was that was taken in 1892. It shows the house and that house as well. But it shows this one really nice, and it has this interesting ornamentation on top there where it looks like it fell off, and then also across the bottom as well. Um, you'll see that, because when you look at it, you say there's something different about the house that's in the video and the house that's here now, and that's it. It was a pretty, they had a, and I think they had a balustrade across the top, a series of a hand, like, uh, like rails, you know, uh, across, across that circle there on top of it. So it was a very interesting house in its day, and, and you know it was one of the one of the big mans one of the huge mansions in the city. It has been carved up into apartments now, but it's kind of a hidden gem. I haven't talked about this house before, um, and someone said, you know, why don't you do the house at 100? I think this is uh, 100 Orchard or 60 Orchard rather. And I said, well, I don't know why I've never done this house. And, and I looked it up and uh, and found other old pictures of it. And it's a nice building. It's a really nice building actually. 
a physician originally went, built it. Um, it has a small porch, which, you know, in eight, by 1880, the wraparound porch was starting to take over Queen Anne's, but this has a pretty small porch. This is the size it's always been. But nonetheless, it's still, it's a really cool house. And uh, I wanted to talk about it tonight. They're pretty interesting, but it's, um, it's lost its, as a matter of fact, when I posted the, uh, when I posted the picture on uh, the web, the historic photos website, one of the former owners said, yeah, my parents bought that house and they carved it up into six, <laughs> six or eight apartments. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming tonight. I know there was a lot happening on AHA night and I'm glad you took the time to spend it with us. So um, thanks again. We're gonna have one more tour. It's going to do County Street from from uh, the Warm Sutter Club to uh, the Golson Chapel and then back on the other doing the other side of the street. So that's the last tour of the season. So hope to see you then. Um, thank, you. thank you very much. See you next time. Thank you. Pensiero, 